Hi guys, this is John Evans and welcome back to a new episode of Book and Spade. I'm here with the eminent professors, uh, Dr. Lydia McGrew and Dr. Tim McGrew, known for analytics, philosophy, and for New Testament studies. So I was wondering guys, if you want to offer any brief introductions before we get into the meat of the matter. Go ahead, Tim, introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, yes, well, uh, I am a professor and have been a professor at Western Michigan University for 25 years now in the philosophy department. And I do specialize in the theory of knowledge and the history and philosophy of science with a very strong and growing research interest in the history of philosophy of religion and Christian apologetics. And I am also a chess master and I make amazing paper airplanes. Uh, I'm Lydia McGrew, um, and I've been on Book and Spade previously. I always enjoy being here with John. Um, I am a homeschooling mother, and I don't make money outside the home except a little bit of, uh, of book uh, royalties, but I write scholarly books and articles. I am a widely published analytic philosopher uh, in the specifically theory of knowledge and probability theory, and some of that just pure probability theory and formal epistemology, and some of it the application of that specifically to the philosophy of religion. And then more recently in the last few years, I've been doing New Testament studies. I've written, uh, published two books on <clears throat> in New Testament studies, Hidden in Plain View and The Mirror of the Mask. And the third book, The Eye of the Beholder on the Gospel of John is with my publisher, right now and uh while we're going to throw in some random fact at the end i raise caterpillars monarch caterpillars it's a hobby so we'll throw in our hobby there awesome and of course all of you guys know my amazing nerd fact is i'm a massive lord of the rings nerd and all right a large part of my love yeah dude alan tsunam and alan tall boy i'm impressed all morning and sandar and as far as i'm so yeah like it, it was yeah, I mean, like, it, this is largely the culmination of a journey that began with analytics and philosophy. Because as a child, you know, I was deeply obsessed with not only Tolkien, but his sources. I read basically Beowulf at age, like, nine. Um, mostly the famous Heaney translation, which I know is supposedly not all that uh, in vogue these days. And, of course, I made my way back to, ultimately, to the source and to the root. And that's all things biblical. And the thing is, although I had an encounter with Jesus Christ quite early, I knew that I wanted to dig deeper in my academic life. And when I went through um, a crisis of faith, particularly visiting some family friends in Ireland uh, very recently, it was really discovering, Tim, uh, your lectures and you know, Lydia, your work on Apologetics Forum on the Four Gospels and the Gospel of John that was deeply supportive and encouraging. So, you know, gobbling as I continue to apply and carry out my doctoral work in New Testament studies and patristics. Um, your work has been incredibly seminal in assisting me and I know many other students who hopefully will be standing in the shoes of those who will hopefully displace the Bart Ehrmans of the world. Uh, which <laughs> I, I could definitely raise an invisible glass to that if I had my, my Dunkin' coffee here on the table. May it be so. Yeah, may it be so. So my first uh, question, which I had for, for both of you, deals with one of the most common, but I find one of the most strong philosophical arguments for the, the deity of Jesus, something that deeply had me thinking for a long time, the famous trilemma, Lord Liar and Lunatic. And one of the areas in which I can see higher criticism, but particularly contemporary evangelical higher criticism, beginning to try and muddy the waters, or what I think could be the muddying of the waters of this issue. We've seen previously that C.S. Lewis would point to passages in John chapter 10, I am the Father and One, or John 8, before Abraham I was, uh, I am rather, uh, very clear statements of, of Yahwehism in relationship to Yeshua. And yet, what we've seen in the evangelical world uh, is an attempt to try to push back on the use of maybe some of those joking terms by preferring the synoptics, uh, which, you know, many evangelicals will gladly date before AD 70, um, as more reliable, and they try to cast shadow and aspersions on the Gospel of John. Now, in light of our discussions previously, Lydia, you know, I the polder stuff and relationship to uh, in plain view. Uh, one question I was going to have is, you know, how would both of you just address the question of both, you know, the generic um, higher criticism approaches to try to take down that trilemma, and then, of course, the, the sort of new Evans-Lacona uh, synthesis of trying to perhaps 
uh, watered down our ability to defend using that trilemma by um, casting questions on the historical statements of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, one of the things that we are trying to do right now in New Testament studies is to um, expand the toolkit of New Testament studies. For too long, New Testament studies in studying the historical Jesus has been tied into a, a very narrow range of criteria uh, known as the criteria of authenticity through the quest for the historical Jesus and the various quests for the historical Jesus to some extent have added some and supposedly gotten a little bit more generous, but not really all that generous uh, as far as what can be, you know, authenticated. So you start off, you, in that approach, you approach the document and, you know, you kind of, everything is, everything is up for grabs. Everything is uh, in, under question or agnosticism. And then you go story by story, sometimes even sentence by sentence. And, you know, you can only confirm that one little bit. And there's never any uh, idea that you could be historically justified in confirming an entire book or an entire document. Now, that is not good historical method. So part of what we're trying to do is to talk about how you can get a view of what the author was like and what his whole document was like and then introduce things that are richer things like we've talked about before on book and spade like undesigned coincidences and little incidental confirmations from the external evidence and so forth to where you get this notion that uh say the author john is a, is a reliable author and then you don't have to separately confirm every sentence in john and and like practice amnesia the minute you move beyond that well we confirmed that but we don't know about this next thing that's not how it works you say this document generally is is reliable so when it reports there's not even anything all that you know improbable i mean if you have a buy even if you had a bias against miracles it's not a miracle for jesus to say before abraham was i am and so then you just say well it looks like he said that this is a report that he did it in a book that we have other confirmations for so that's how we're we're approaching it. I don't know if, if Tim has something he'd like to add to that reply. Yeah, let me just flesh out something that you said there, Lydia. I think you could maybe put the difference between our approach and the approach of some other, including evangelical scholars, uh, in short compass by saying that where many of them restrict themselves to looking at criteria, we are looking at evidence, and evidence is a wider set of considerations than just criteria. And because of that, we're free to look at evidence that confirms the historical trustworthiness of an author or of an entire work. Now, when I say confirms, that's not a guarantee. Some people get nervous if you don't offer them guarantees, but in historical work, we don't get logical guarantees. It's not a branch of mathematics. This is an area where we weigh evidence and we find what is most probable. And I think what Lydia and I have been trying to do that is new in a way is to draw attention to whole categories of evidence that people have not been looking at to make inferences of a sort that are, yeah, somewhat bolder than many people feel comfortable making, but I think they're most necessary. They're the sorts of inferences we would make in everyday life. If I have a friend who has proven truthful time after time after time, I don't approach what that friend tells me next with extreme skepticism or blank agnosticism. I learn which people are trustworthy. And I don't see any compelling line of argument that says we can't extend that to Luke or to John or to Matthew. That just seems to me to be an unreasonable truncation of the inferential resources available to us. We should be able to use evidence in the same way. Well, you argue, because I think both of you have mentioned this before in previous programs on the Politics Forum and in uh, individual lectures before, that there seems to be a double standard that's being applied to New Testament studies than other writings in the ancient world. Tacitus, for example, even the, the writing of Flavius Josephus in the sense that, you know, when I sat down for a course in Second Temple Judaism, you know, very estimable graduate course, uh, no one was really um, diving sentence by sentence or episode by episode in Flavius Josephus, whether these events were reliable. Now, were there questions? Yes. But ultimately, it was through the author's proximity to the events and what biases might have gone into his presentation or influences, maybe that's a fairer term, 
uh, in representing those events. And in the same way, if I look at someone like the historical figure of John, what's unique for me, just speaking as, as a historian, if I look at uh, the patristic evidence that all the, the uh, those who use criteria theory seem to be neglecting, but both of you seem to be you know, deeply drawing from, we have John's students and their students who are still alive within living memory. And the fact that John is so well lived, uh, along with someone like Luke, who is definitely in contact with several eyewitnesses. There does seem to be a greater body of living memory here than elsewhere in the ancient world. Do you think this um, neglect of the patristic or living memory theory, as it were, do you think it's out of a philosophical bias uh, along a more uh, deconstructionist, almost Sartre approach? Where do you think it's coming from and how best to tactfully um, introduce this new voice into the field? Well, there are a lot of different routes to that particular uh, tree of modern criticism. Uh, there are some people who do pull from the postmodern side, and I find that just baffling. I, I don't understand the attractions of that. Having lived through a graduate degree in which half of my department was wholly on the continental postmodern side of things, and the other half were sort of standing back either vaguely shocked or outright appalled by it. I, I've never really felt the attraction in that direction, quite quite the contrary. Um, but I think also besides that, there is some aversion, not always uh, deliberate in evangelical circles, but I think sometimes in the people from whom they draw without realizing it, uh, an aversion to the miraculous. And so if someone is skeptical of a text because it contains miracles, then we have to have a philosophical discussion. All right, is that really a good ground for being skeptical? Let's talk about that. And if someone has been taught by someone who is skeptical of the miraculous, maybe he's not skeptical himself, but he's just imbibed along with the lectures of his Dr. Fatar, the uh, sort of skittishness about certain passages, that's a problem. And I think a third thing, and this ties in with your comment up about the patristic evidence particularly, is there's been a swing of the pendulum away from the patristic evidence toward purely literary criticism. And so that takes us into the question of the higher criticism, but I will just say that I think many contemporary scholars are much too impressed by the sweeping conclusions they think they can draw from purely literary evidence. And actually, once you look into it a little bit more deeply, a lot of these conjectures go so far beyond what the evidence will bear that if we're using our literary conjectures to throw away patristic evidence, I think we have a very serious methodological problem. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Oh yeah, no, you, you go on, Lydia. Okay, well, I would introduce just a, a couple of other sources. Um, one is another double standard, different from the one that you were talking about, John. And this is a double standard between um, showing that something is reliable and allegedly showing that it's unreliable. So, you know, if you get the census in Luke uh, and they can't, you know, scholars argue which census is he referring to, this is taken to cast this huge shadow over Luke. You know, nobody says, oh, well, that's just one one thing in Luke. We can't conclude that Luke is unreliable because we have trouble figuring out when the census was. It's just like, boom, you know, and, and Tim has told me a story about a scholar who threw out the reliability of Luke and Acts because he had heard that there were no poisonous snakes on the island of Malta. And, um, and Tim actually met, met this scholar in Europe, I believe. And so this is, you know, and there aren't any poisonous snakes in the Isle of Malta. And there's a story where um, Paul is bitten by a snake and the, the natives assume it's poisonous. Uh, Luke doesn't even, you know, say like it, it's definitely poisonous, but like there goes Luke, boom, you know. So there's this immediacy to throwing out reliability, but there's no, nothing similar to generalizing to being reliable when you and so you can have case after case after case where they're confirmed and we never draw the conclusion hey it looks like they're reliable and that the few cases where we have 
problems or discrepancies, those are the exceptions. Instead, it's the alleged problems or discrepancies that are taken to be typical, and we're going to generalize that they're unreliable. So that's a very problematic double standard. Um, the other thing is that I think back in the 19th century, um, you had what I call anti-standards. Um, so they're like bad standards of historical inquiry that got enshrined, they got put in place, and they don't bear any anti-supernatural bias on their face. So it would be things like, you know, if you have two sort of similar events, let's assume that these are uh, variations upon one original and somebody embellished or there was a legendary accretion, you know, we'll never uh, think that, you know, the same general type of thing could have happened twice. And, you know, all of these really bad historical principles, they got put into place and then they got labeled as the standards of professional historical Jesus scholarship. And then generations have followed, you know, we're talking 150 years here at this point, at least, maybe, maybe even more, where generation after generation of scholars have been have been uh, educated and they come in and, and it's like when when Bart Ehrman says there's an irreconcilable difference here. Bart doesn't say there's an irreconcilable difference. He's a famous skeptical scholar, of course. He doesn't say there's an irreconcilable contradiction because I'm biased against the supernatural. No, he just says, look, historically, this is, you know, and you shouldn't harmonize because that's writing your own gospel. You know, so he just brings in these bad methodological assumptions that bear no obvious immediate relationship to supernaturalism. And so then that causes, I believe, some... Uh, Christian scholars who have no bias against the supernatural to to think, well, you know, I need to talk like this too. I need to talk about um, let's not be naive. Let's not over harmonize. Harmonizations are strained. Uh, let's. Uh, this may perhaps go back to a source prior to John and closer to the historical Jesus. That's how you know, well-educated scholars talk, right? You know, so they pick up these modes of thinking and talking in a somewhat unconscious uh, fashion. And so that fleshes out some of what Tim was talking about, about the sort of this, this lineage. And at that point, if we come along and say, well, way back in that lineage, you've got an anti-supernatural bias, then that's taken to be, you know, a genetic fallacy. So I'm not, I'm not so much leaning on that as I'm just saying, well, they're really bad methods. And I don't know quite how they got in here, but those are not good historical methods, so don't follow them. And if you were to apply those same methods, for example, to the life of Socrates, the historical Socrates, we have none of his personal writings. We basically have Plato and Xenophanes, and those are basically passed on through Aristotle. So ultimately, it's, it's third-hand information, but it's within the living memory of faithful eyewitnesses. And, you know, granted, we will question criteria and bias, but clearly, if I open up any just regular textbook taught to, you know, basically juniors in high school to graduate level courses, there's still an acceptance as far as I'm aware of that data. And the nearest, you know, copy of what Plato's writings comes from over 1,500 years after the event. I mean, while we have our earliest fragment of the Gospel of John, as far as I'm aware, really early second century, potentially with only a decade after, you know, ink hits papyri. That, that frightens me because if I use the same um, very critical methodology that, that you've just outlined with those double standards, then to the rest of ancient history, we have no ancient history whatsoever at all. And then it, it's very, very, very hard to make those standards. And one of the questions which, you know, I was sort of meditating on in light of your, your last book, The Mirror of the Mask, Lydia, and, and in your uh, wonderful lectures, Tim, particularly where the argument of silence came up, is this idea ultimately of this impulse against harmonization because the assumption is things are incrementally growing up from this small kernel of event uh, to essentially this elaborate history. When historically, it's, it's almost as though these scholars have forgotten, Airmen, even Lacona and Evans, that when you're dealing with you know, the pre-70 AD church, you're dealing with a scenario where any bit of writing that is taking place is occurring under incredible duress. I mean, basically persecution under Nero. Uh, beforehand, you have essentially communities in flight versus John, you know, yes, he's undergone persecution, but he's in Ephesus, I'm assuming, circa 90 AD, and he has much more time 
in order to, to produce a kind of work like that. Um, are those resources uh, being forgotten because the theory outweighs just the embarrassment, the riches of data? Or would you argue this could be chalked up primarily to uh, not just the methodology, but to, I think, as, as one of you have put it, a, a treatment of eyewitness testimony in the ancient world as meaning something very different. Um, I know Lacona likes to make this argument, the same thing with Evans and, and even uh, many others, more mainstream scholars like uh, William Lane Craig, though, you know, in the past, uh, the transmission of truth meant something very different. Um, I obviously know in light of our discussions about Papias and early fragments that that is not the case, but how would you articulate to an audience unfamiliar with these terms uh, how the truth for the New Testament uh, readers meant precisely the same kind of truth that we mean here today and that there is no uh, disruption in continuity of thought from then to now? Well, there's, there's an interesting question as to how this has happened. Um, I have a theory, and this is just a theory that it, I have. It might not be correct, but I look at classicists and how they treat some of these folks like um, Josephus or uh, even Plutarch. And what I see is, it, you know, even going back into the 20th century, um, there was a certain amount of, oh, what, what word should I use, uh, patronization that took place. So they would say, well, you know, they were just careless. You know, and so if they found what appeared to be an error, I think sometimes they were way too quick uh, to to think there was an error or something. But they would they would say, well, they were just sloppy or whatever. Now that came to seem uh, unsophisticated when you got later in the 20th century, even in classics, even in uh, those areas. And so, and and I I see this in. Um, in literature too, I see this in English literature as well. The obvious is 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 seen as naive or uninteresting. So even in places where it looks like Josephus did just make stuff up or engage in propaganda or Plutarch did just make a mistake, that's too obvious, you know. So like I, I like to say in Spencer studies, just to say Edmund Spencer was influenced by you know Neoplatonism. Well, you know, duh, everybody knows that. Yeah, how are you going to write a dissertation on that? So what you got, I think, coming into classics and then somewhat from thence into New Testament was something that sounded a little more sophisticated. So you took the same thing and instead of uh, saying, well, actually, you know, maybe Plutarch really was telling the truth or instead of saying, yeah, he made a mistake or just saying he was careless or whatever, we put a new spin on it. And the new spin was, well, ancient people had a different view of truth and so forth. Now, this isn't hard postmodernism. It isn't anything as strong as deconstruction. It's what I would call soft postmodernism. It's just this sort of, and so, and you see this in many of the humanities, that the pre-modern view is being remade in the image of the contemporary scholar, where it's seen as cool to change facts. And instead of just saying, well, they just erred or something, which is what the hard-nosed older scholar would have said, uh, oh yeah, those ancient guys, they couldn't look stuff up, you know, they didn't have our resources or whatever, or they were careless. Instead, you'd say, ah, they were careless but it was cool that they were careless, you know? And so that kind of flowed into, um, you know, into New Testament studies from there as well. And, and then we, we answer it by just showing that that's not, uh, that's not true. And that the, for one thing, that the mistakes uh, are not as common as they think they are, particularly in the gospels, even more so and also from external quotations as well. But I'd like to give Tim a chance to have some input here too. Yeah, I would just add to what Lydia said that many of the arguments to say that there are either errors or literary devices that reveal a different view of truth actually are, are astonishingly flimsy. And when you take them apart and you look at them, you realize that not only were these a very poor pretext for drawing that kind of conclusion, but also the very search for, well, let's just take the literary devices as an example, turns out to obscure some of the actual evidence that we have 
for the meticulousness and the reliability of these authors. When you are trying to say that Luke has silently moved this or that event to a different place at a different time and situated it among different people and transferred words from one person to another, uh, doubled up or eliminated deliberately to try to give an impression that he knows isn't the truth because he thinks that somehow this is theologically richer, you are doing a grave disservice to Luke and you're missing the evidence in the gospel and in the book of Acts that Luke is actually an unbelievably meticulous historian. So not only do I think that these arguments are often just poor from the standpoint of just sitting in and looking at the literary evidence brought forward and saying, oh, all right, well then let's conclude that this is an error or that's a, a literary device that involves altering the facts, but also they're overlooking the very thing that they should be looking for, which is the evidence that these authors actually are close up to the facts and habitually reliable. I would. I want to add something kind of interesting here. I was asked um, at a at a breakout session that I gave at a conference in January. Well, how do you think that the ancient people were different from us? And I said, well, if anything, I would say that in the first and second centuries they were maybe even more in, inclined to harmonize than we are, uh, and maybe even inclined to do so in ways that we would find. Um, kind of kind of wooden um so for example there now this is um heretical and i'm not saying it's canonical but there's something called i believe it's the gospel of the ebionites and at jesus baptism they actually uh wrote this harmonistic passage where the father says from heaven both you are my beloved son and this is my beloved son now i would see that as just a trivial verbal variation in reportage but the gospel of the ebionites is trying to be so you know stringent that they actually have him say both and so if anything and and uh richard balcom for example talks about uh scribes who would try to harmonize like we have scribes who would actually change the text to you know fix something that they saw as an error scribal harmonization is a thing um, when they were just copying the Gospels or something like that. So, um, and and then of course you have the Diatessaron, which is very early, which tries to put, you know, like everything in there and has to make all these decisions because it's just one continuous story known as a harmony of the Gospels. So if anything, you could almost say that the men of the very early patristic age were more naive in their approach to uh, you know, truth and error and harmonization, even then can, we are now, rather than it's being the other way around where, you know, we've become all, you know, hung up and fundamentalist and they were loosey goosey about truth. I would say if anything, the evidence goes the other way. And I think that makes a lot of sense in light of, you know, let's, let's assume as, as I, I do by faith and through good evidence, through, through faith and reasons, um, that essentially the events described actually occurred, then what that means ultimately is, is if you've encountered God taking on human flesh, and if he has actually left through, you know, eyewitness record, uh, not only, uh, you know, records of the events described and, and a complex liturgy, what that ultimately means is you're not going to treat those very sacred objects or items very lightly. You would want to pre even preserve potentially the autographs as much as possible. And this leads me to a very interesting argument that I know, Tim, that you've worked on in the past for a, a long time. This is the idea of the argument from silence that is often employed because, you know, what is often uh, employed, I find, by the Airmans of the world, and now sadly, I think also too by some uh, fellow Christian scholars, is this idea that, you know, because Mark does not mention the virgin birth, therefore, uh, this concept is not yet known, despite the fact there is internal evidence to suggest that that idea, that construct, is very well known, and it's based in an actual historical event. Or, for example, more popularly, and this is what, you know, led me down the whole uh, uh, McGrew uh, train of research, uh, the I am statements. You know, Luke is such a great historian, why does he exclude this data along with Matthew and Mark? It becomes a, a false dichotomy of three against one. I, I, what I've discovered, and 
you know, maybe professors, you, you can help uh, illuminate us here on this, is that ultimately when you are dealing with specific audiences, just because all that we have right now is the gospel according to Matthew, that doesn't mean that's all that Matthew ever wrote. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And if the data is still can be gathered within the living memory of witnesses and then their own uh, followers, uh, is it even probable and legitimate probability theory that accretions could occur only within a single century? I was wonder wondering if you'd be willing to tackle uh, some of those giants and hopefully tear them down. So let me just say a couple of things. First of all, anybody can make up a story and that doesn't take a century to do. So we don't want to leave ourselves vulnerable by making too strong a statement of a principle and then letting somebody say, oh, but I can show you a story that arose within the lifetime of some sage or something like that. So anybody can make up a story. What I think is not credible is the idea that a made up story without a foundation in fact, without credible eyewitnesses behind it, could wholly supplant what a vigorous community knew about the central figure of their faith, right? We're, we're not talking about somebody's making up a story about George Washington as a child chopping down a cherry tree and then saying to his father, I cannot tell a lie, I cut it down. That could well be just a legend. But to invent an entire life of George Washington that has nothing to do with his being a soldier in the Revolutionary War, nothing to do with his becoming president of the United States, nothing to do with you know any of the other figures of the American Revolutionary period, and say, oh, but that's the real life of George Washington, and then have people believe you despite all the evidence we have for the actual life, that doesn't happen. That's a kind of supplanting that does not occur. And so when people are trying to say, oh, well, you know, maybe we have just legends that grew up around the figure of Jesus. We have from the beginning, and we have this attested, of course, in secular stories, uh, sources. Uh, we've got Tacitus from Annals 1544, for example, saying how rapidly the Christian story spread. This was something that a community of people ultimately, fundamentally, deeply interested in knowing exactly what happened was keen to preserve. And to try to say that that got supplanted by a bunch of legends is, I think, just historically inept. That's not the way these kinds of things develop. So there's just one point on that that I think is just a, a methodological misstep from the get-go, the idea that we could have stories, wholly made up stories or largely fabrication, supplanting what's already known in the community. That is I think what we have every right to just discard as a hypothesis. There's nothing going for that. Lydia, go ahead and jump in. You've got some things to say here too. Well, um, you know, as far as arguments from silence are concerned, we, we have to, what Tim showed in his article, and I know he'll, he can say more to this, is that you have to um, really examine the premise that if this had happened, it would be stated in this document. So uh, sometimes Tim will make a great analogy. Um, he'll say, let's take the premise, I do not see a, um, I do not see a spider in this room right now. Now, how good of an argument is that for the conclusion that there is no spider in this room? Well, it's, it's a pretty poor argument. And the reason is because you have this premise, you know, if there were a spider in this room right now, I would see it. Well, spiders are small and there are a lot of books around here and it could be a spider somewhere that I just can't see. And so then we look at the premise, you know, if Jesus had uttered the I am sayings, they would be recorded in one or the other of the synoptic gospels. Um, so, you know, how probable is that? Well, here's where we really do need to not be anachronistic um, and not take it that Mark and Matthew and Luke were all trying to answer the same kind of questions we're trying to answer. You know, were they all saying, oh, the, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses are about to come to my door. I need to give the people, you know, the, the, the wherewithal to answer them. Uh, we also need to reckon with the fact that there is partial dependence precisely in the selection of material between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I think what we find is that uh, sometimes they tell 
the same story, but one of them will have some additional details or information about that. So there's partial independence, but it's amazing how many of the same stories they tell. We don't know. I'm not going to give you a disquisition on the my solution to the synoptic problem, exactly how that came about. But what I think we can say is that when it came to selecting material, a lot of times uh, two of those guys were probably partially dependent on one of them or in some way they were partially dependent on each other. So that means that if... Uh, you know, one of them chose not to tell those stories, that actually raises the odds that the others are not going to tell those stories. It's not like each of them necessarily sat down and said, you know, hmm, should I include this story about Jesus saying before Abraham was I am? No, I guess I won't include it. Uh, scroll only included a certain amount of stuff. And once they filled it, you know, it was filled, they were, they were going to stop. Whereas John, it seems to me, is very deliberately supplementing the, yes. the synoptic gospels. And I think that's, it's really important. So he's like deliberately including this stuff partly because it wasn't included. It's almost a, a negative dependence relation that if they don't include it, you know, he's more likely to include it. So um, those are some reasons to question that argument from silence. We come to the text with our question, what is the strongest possible evidence that could be given for Jesus deity? Well, it's these sayings in John. And so then we assume that Mark, Matthew and Luke are sitting down and saying to themselves, how can I include the strongest possible evidence I've ever heard for Jesus deity? And then the, if they don't include this, that must mean they'd never heard it, which may mean, mean that it never happened. These are all uh, very questionable links in a chain of inference to it never happened uh, that we can analyze probabilistically in the terms that, that Tim discussed in his writing on the argument from silence. Can I just add something to that? Even apart from a formal discussion, even apart from rolling out the probability theory and trying to analyze the argument and show its moving pieces in mathematical detail, I think it can be useful just to reflect on how badly the argument from silence would mislead us if we were to apply it in secular history. So just a few examples, none of which come from biblical studies, okay? Marco Polo never mentions the Great Wall of China, which, although it wasn't the magnificent structure that we now have, was hundreds of miles long, uh, never mentions it, never mentions um, printed uh, money, never mentions tea, although he has to have traveled through the tea districts of China. So should we conclude that he never visited China or that these things weren't there at the time? No, neither of those. He just coulda, woulda, shoulda, he doesn't. Ulysses Grant wrote two volumes of his memoirs of the Civil War. They're dated, they're like diary entries. Mark Twain, uh, Samuel Clemens, the American humorist and author encouraged Grant to do this. And there's no mention in Grant's two volumes of memoirs of the Civil War, of the Emancipation Proclamation. It just doesn't happen. Uh, Xenophon and Aristotle, ancient writers, make no mention of the works of Thucydides. We don't hear about the works of Thucydides until we come to Polybius more than 250 years after they were written. Um, the archives of Barcelona don't have any mention of the return of Christopher Columbus. The archives in Portugal don't have any mention of the travels of Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, again and again and again, there are things we know took place where if we were to follow the argument from silence, the way that it is followed in biblical studies, we would end up discarding things that outside of biblical studies, we know perfectly well are true. We apply the argument from silence vigorously there in ways that we would blush to do elsewhere. That is its own sort of double standard. I think people sometimes get confused concerning the argument from silence between using it when you literally have zero evidence of the thing at all and using it against evidence that you have. So, for example, I'm, I'm going to make up a name right now. Um, um, Jim Lehi. I literally just made that up right now. So uh, and and uh, the hypothetical Jim Lehi is a, a graduate student at um, uh, Western Michigan University, and uh, he's interested in philosophy of language. Okay, 
I just made him up. I have no evidence that he exists. I have a low probability that this person exists who, whose name I, and, and characteristics I just made up this minute. You can say that's an argument from silence. And in a sense it is. I'm disbelieving in the existence of the hypothetical person I just made up. Why? Because I have zero evidence that someone that specific exists and it's a highly specific uh, description. But that could be overcome in an instant by Tim's coming home from, from uh, you know, a meeting one day and saying, we have a new student named Jim Lehigh. Is that the name I just said? Yeah, Jim Lehigh, who's interested in the philosophy of language. He just came into the, in the uh, entering class today. So am I going to say, well, no, yours is the only testimony I have. Everything has to be tested twice. I'm sorry. You know, uh, I, I just met with somebody else in your department the other day and he didn't mention Jim Lehigh. So I guess he doesn't exist. And that would obviously be foolish. So we need to distinguish between, um, you know, the golden teapot that's orbiting uh, the sun, which we don't believe in because we have no evidence for it. Zero, literally zero. And using an argument from silence against something that we have independent evidence for. That's a very different matter. Yeah, just building on that, one of the interesting specific evidences, I think against the, uh, the, the supposed low Christology, uh, I, I would even suggest that implicitly it's not coming through the evidence of the hypotheses, but even more, you know, in a much more hard-nosed way through a complete skeptic like an airman or a John Dominic Crossan, uh, is the fact that Paul is running around uh, you know, in Second Philippians, sorry, Philippians chapter two, rather, right. and Colossians one, offering incredible, massive, joking sounding creedal statements, uh, which essentially could match later creedal formulas in you know, 325 AD. Uh, and even, you know, with a creedal formula, even in Irenaeus, which makes sense. How does Paul arrive at Philippians chapter two? with only uh, the, these strange skeptical, uh, nearly prophetic utterances of Jesus, supposedly only found in the synoptics. And of course, you know, you and I all know that you know, we have the Johannine Thunderbolt. And there are, of course, sections that point to more Johannine sounding terms. But it seems to me that if you were to discount all Johannine evidence at all, if you were to blow it out of the water entirely and say, oh, this is literary, it's not meant to be historical, despite geographies and inter internal consistencies absolutely with history, you'd be left with a massive problem, I would feel, between uh, a legitimate Pauline harmonization of these events, uh, with not only within living memory, but within, what, only five or six years of the events described. That argument alone led me to dive, you know, Tim, into your defense of, of Luke, and uh, you, Lydia, in your work with uh, Evidence in Plain View with, with your recent publication. I would add that uh, if you look at the specifics of that creedal statement in Philippians 2, there's some really fascinating things there. The, uh, the statement that Jesus Christ is Lord is a wonderful one because that is the word that the Jewish translators of the Old Testament scriptures into Greek, the, what we call the Septuagint, um, used for the sacred name when they were rendering it over. They, they took their own substitute for it because they don't want to say the tetragrammaton. That, that is too sacred for speech. So they substituted Adonai, and then they rendered that over as kurios, Lord, in Greek. Now, it's true that in a wider a range of Greek texts, the word kurios, can have a merely mild honorific meaning like sir. It's sort of like the Latin domine in that respect. But if you look at what Paul is doing with it here, right, given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is, you can't just say sir at that point. Lord is carrying heavier meaning there. So especially to a Jewish audience for whom the name is all important, the name of God is incredibly important. This is clearly the highest Christology. And I think this is why the scholar Simon Gathercole at Cambridge likes to say, and this both of the Pauline letters and of the synoptics, the earliest Christology is the highest Christology.
And so there's no tension there between the Christology being advanced in the other gospels and in John. There's just a difference of the way that that's illustrated some specific statements. But again, if we demand that every specific reported statement of Jesus be duplicated before we'll take it seriously, we're applying a principle that would have us throwing out great tracts of secular history as well. That is not reasonable. Let's just have no double standards. That's all. You know, um, I, I would add that I think with those really hard news, like you were mentioning, liberal scholars, I think there is a, a lot of question begging taking place. Um, so they, they just start with this a priori principle that Christology grew, you know, and, and that high Christology is late Christology. And then if they find something that seems like high Christology, it's like, well, then I guess that must be late. You know, I guess Paul must have invented this high Christology. It's, it's, it's Pauline, you know. Um, and of course, that's obviously a, an a priori approach to history that's it's, it's not justified. If you have no other reason to question this, uh, then just that it contradicts your, your assumption that high Christology is late, then you're not going to be able to learn if you're wrong. So that would be yes. one thing I would want to mention. Um, I, I also want to add that there's this notion almost that Jesus had to learn who he was through Jesus, uh, through, through secular means, through Jewish texts or oh, something and yeah. i know and 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 that's question begging too though in a more subtle sort of way so there'd be this idea well jesus was a first century jew how or why would he ever even have conceived of himself as god so then we get to arguing and uh, maybe we you know some of the evangelicals and i don't really agree with this they'll use intertestamental literature um i'm trying to think i think it's uh second esdras or something you know um and the book of Enoch or something to argue that Jesus like was familiar with this stuff and that he kind of convinced himself that he was God like we it's like we have to have some human way for Jesus to figure out a divine self-understanding and I definitely don't think we should succumb to that assumption because again if Jesus really was God then presumably he had other ways of knowing that he was God than by reading intertestamental literature you know or Jew the Jewish apocrypha he presumably had some kind of special communion with his father so if we're not to beg the question against Christianity we need to consider well what resources would have been available to him if in fact the, the Christian doctrine is true. Yeah, I mean, this is something which has been really bothering me lately, too, because, you know, I, I'm big fans of a, a lot of mainstream, uh, you know, defenders of faith, uh, apologists, but many of them because uh, I think of a fascination with modern psychological methods or because of a very, uh, perhaps maybe overly wooden form of Sola Scriptura, uh, have been falling into very strange forms of Christology. Uh, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that the only form of Christology is one where we must uh, adopt every single formulation from the fourth and fifth century, et cetera. But the thing is, I, you know, I see William Lane Craig advancing a kind of neo-Apollinarianism, uh, some denying the eternal generation of God the Son, and it's leading to a point where I believe even um, N.T. Wright, and I would love to interview all these guys, they're, they're great heroes of mine, but it, I think even he suggests a kind of internal crisis in the mind of the incarnate second person of the Trinity. And, you know, I hope I'm not misreading these scholars, but if the cream of the crop themselves are suggesting an internal crisis or insecurity within the second person of the Trinity, then how on earth are we then supposed to advance to the entire world that Jesus Christ is Hakurios, is Yahweh, to the glory of Yahweh, the Father? It seems to really hurt uh, the, the Great Commission altogether. One other point philosophically I would love to get your take on, and this is something I've been meditating on for quite a long time. Uh, essentially, philosophically, um, there's no category that I can find in Second Temple Judaism for the exaltation of a creature to divine status. And I know in Second Enoch, there's a description of Enoch being ascended to an angelic-like status to that of Metatron, uh, but that doesn't seem to be a very... A uh, common form of uh, work that fixed and deeply in place culturally. So when a higher critic suggests, like Rudolf Boltman, that essentially when you begin in Acts chapter two with uh, uh, the statement of Peter, 
and therefore God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ, that somehow this is an ontological statement rather than a positional statement, uh, to claim that from uh, the writing of Luke to, to John with only 20 or 30 years, you have this massive shift in Christology. That seems to be absolutely ludicrous in, in light of um, uh, Philippians chapter 2 and Colossians 1. Uh, how would just you respond to these current trends in uh, Christology? Would you suggest that it is an overemphasis on modern philosophical methods, being enamored with them? Um, and if so, philosophically, uh, should we return to more of a traditionalist approach? How would you suggest uh, maintaining just, just the clear, I think, transparent reading of sacred scripture and its context? Um, I'm a little, I, I'm concerned about a way that these things are being done. Now, this is not a person whose work I've read in detail, so I want to be careful. It's possible I'm misunderstanding him, but I think uh, to some extent the work of Dr. Michael Heiser is, um, I wouldn't say lying behind, but it's kind of coming in in its own stream with, with some of this, which is the idea of an Old Testament binetarianism in Judaism. Um, where there's this this head of the divine council who's below the below Yahweh, but he's also called a god, and that you know we could believe in that, and then Jesus is that, and then it's just one small step upward to make him, you know, truly equal with the Father. And, and I think Heiser actually may have a, a Orthodox Christology himself, but he's trying to make room in in Judaism for this in-between category of, of gods so that the teaching of Jesus is not so foreign, you know, to his audience. Like, well, they already believed in, in this uh, uh, d discarnate divine being and then and then Jesus was that and then the Christian just believed a little bit more or something like that. Um, I think that's questionable. I am not convinced by the Old Testament texts that are being brought forward to um, to to support that. And I think we need to be willing to say that Jesus was teaching something that was just a thunderbolt to his audience. He actually was, and I'm not saying it was in contradiction to the Old Testament, but I will go so far as to say it was in contradiction to an interpretation they had put on the Old Testament that was not unreasonable. That is to say the absolute monotheism, which I believe was the monotheism of uh, Second Temple Judaism in which Jesus came and which precluded any incarnation. It was not a dumb interpretation of the Old Testament. Uh, you know, I happen to think there's more there, you know, in the Old Testament, but it's subtle. And so when Jesus came in and said this stuff, bam, you know, that it was shocking. And so we need to be willing to say that. When we do that, then I think we're not going to feel so much like the creedal formulations you know, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made and so forth are so foreign or, or Greek or whatever. If we just say Jesus was a Jew, but God was teaching something new to the Jews and something that was legitimately really sh new to them uh, and surprising to them, then I'm not saying, you know, we have to get into specific Aristotelian categories of substance, but we can have a Christology that you could not have deduced from the Old Testament. And, and that's okay, because Jesus had to send the Son, uh, Jesus had to come as the Son to reveal something about the Father that was not known before, and we should just accept that fact. Uh, I'm going to let Tim have some input yeah, there. Just let me pick up on this and say that, so I'll also, I'll do something that's a bit conjectural um, or point to something, but it's something I found fascinating, and that's uh, some of Richard Hay's work in his book, Reading Backwards, which is a very sensitive treatment of some of the use of the Old Testament in the New. So one thing that I find fascinating is there are, as you know, John, all sorts of passages in the first couple of chapters of Matthew, where Matthew makes reference to some Old Testament passage. And let's just say it is not evident at a first glance what is going on there. So I like the one, uh, when Israel was a child, I knew him, and out of Egypt have I called my son. Hosea 11, right? Now, he brings this up and says that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet, and then he quotes that. And it's when Jesus and Mary and Joseph 
go down to Egypt to avoid the rage of a deadly king, right? What is, how is that a fulfillment of that passage? That passage is talking about the Exodus. That's not, it's not at all clear. But here's something that Hayes does that I think is, is at least worthy of consideration. If you consider not just the first verse of Hosea 11, but the entire pericope, the entire passage there, it's a lament for the many ways that Israel, who gets referred to as Ephraim, right, he uses various names, has left, has wandered away from Jehovah, from Yahweh. And if you follow it all the way through to the end, he says that he's not going to destroy them again. Um, and then it, it says this, this wonderful verse, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. Now the Ark of the Covenant is gone, right? So who's the Holy One in our midst now? Even in Hosea's time, the Ark is gone. And you, you look at that and you think, okay, so a devout Jew would have his mind drawn through a passage like we would be drawn through the words of a song that we know. And you start to connect that up with the way that he's introduced Emmanuel, where he's glossed it in Matthew 1. He said, that is God with it. Well, God with us in what sense? Wait a minute, the Holy One in your midst. What, what is going on here? And what Hayes suggests, and, and I find this at least worthy of consideration, is that Matthew is with almost infinite care drawing the minds of his countrymen, his fellow Jews, through their own scriptures to what is initially an almost unthinkable conclusion regarding the identity of the Messiah. That the Messiah is God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. And there are little things like this, little touches like this with all sorts of those passages that are brought up in the first few chapters of Matthew, where you can't put your finger down on a page without being within an inch of some saying that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken. And if you read around the context of those, a lot of things really pop out. It's quite fascinating. So I'll just, I'll put that out there as something worthy of consideration. And, and I think that that's compatible with what I'm saying, because my point is that those are subtle. Yes. Very. So, you know, they're, they're very subtle. So it's not like, you know, it should have just already been obvious or it's something that they could have could have already known. And so I think when we're talking about Jesus in the in the Old Testament or Jesus in a Jewish context and the and the incarnation in a Jewish context, we're constantly having to balance two things. You know, the one error would be to say that Christianity really is like a, a heresy. In comparison to Old Testament Judaism, like no, it's just a contradiction. The way that we we Christians would think of, say, um, the the Reverend Sun Myung Moon's claims about himself, we would say, you know, no, you're not another, you're you're not another Messiah. You know that it's just heresy. Um, and so we don't want to say that. We don't want to say that it actually contradicts it. So finding Jesus in the Old Testament and following those typological interpretations and those wonderful subtle things that Matthew is doing and, and the others are doing as well, that's perfectly legitimate. But then at the, on the other hand, we don't want to go over into saying, so they already knew that the Messiah was God. It, they're attempting to stone Jesus when he made his claims would be, you know, inexplicable. Because one of the interesting things there in John 10 is that they've said, tell us plainly if you are the Messiah. So they have no trouble with him telling them that he's the Messiah. But then when he says, I and the Father are one, then they try to stone him. What does this tell us? It tells us that in their minds, the Messiah was not one with the Father, right? Because the one thing they're fine with, the other thing they're not fine with. It's, it's the same crowd. Either. Or at least they're open it, to the one and they're totally close yeah, to the other. Exactly, right. And they actually want him to spit it out, you know, stop hiding it or whatever and so forth. So we're constantly walking that line, uh, you know, between saying, yes, yes, Christianity is the continuation of it's the same God it's the, and so forth. And then on the other hand saying, but it was a, it was, a brand new revelation to them. And in that way, I think we can get a, a very high Christology that is nonetheless authentically Jewish. Another point too, which I find really, all four gospels try to hammer home the preparation of the coming of Yahweh. What's 
be home, uh, particularly in Malachi chapter three. You know, behold, I saw my messenger before my face, prepare the way before me, and then, you know, Ha'adon, the messenger of the covenant, Yahweh himself is coming to his temple. If there's one aspect which I find really interesting, which even the, you know, the supposed higher critics will accept, it's supposedly the cleansing of the temple, and supposedly the, you know, uh, the arrival of Christ in light of the ministry of John the Baptist looking like the prophet Elijah. Now, I cannot possibly see how you could look at, therefore, the synoptic statements of Jesus over and over again in light of essentially a direct fulfillment or self-fulfillment of Malachi 3. And if it's very clear that the person coming in Malachi 3 is Yahweh, and if it's very clear that at every single possible turn, that Christ is identifying himself with Yahweh directly, uh, both in action and in statement, to claim that the authors of the synoptics, and I, you know, I hold to the traditional authorship in light of Papias and Irenaeus, uh, the thing is, you know, how could one wiggle your way out without fundamentally disrupting a transmission from them to Paul? That's where my mind is just utterly blown and baffled now is how could one legitimately seem, uh, see room for growth there without importing potentially external philosophy that states that there has to be something incremental in time? I think what you'd have to do is really lean on Paul's unpopularity. You know, you'd, you'd have to really lean on the fact that the Jews just hate You know, that's why they hated him, because he was, you know, importing... It's not given as the reason. And reason for the Jewish persecution of Paul and hatred of Paul is that allegedly he's teaching people not to follow the Mosaic law. It doesn't even mention Christology as a reason for his unpopularity. So I don't think that would be a good argument. But if I were to try to do it and argue for a Pauline uh, development of Christology, that's probably the direction I'd go. I'd probably, you know, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but, you know, I'd probably say, well, yeah, the Jews hated Paul. And so they could tell he was in introducing something that was, you know, foreign to his own uh, Jewish heritage. And that's what I would, I would try. But Tim probably has something intelligent to say here. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that there was quite a game in the early 19th century of writing books that blamed the origins of Christianity on Paul and mm -hmm. said, oh, you know, Jesus, at least after we've managed to carve out all the bits that we don't want to take real careful notice of from the Gospels, and we were left with a Jefferson Bible or something. Uh, you know, Jesus isn't all that uh, offensive a character, but Paul, man, in every which way, Paul really uh, did things that were both uh, shocking to Judaism and uh, repugnant to our modern 19th century mind. Jeremy Bentham, the philosopher who was, I believe, the godfather of John Stuart Mill and the and Bentham was, of course, a father of utilitarianism, yeah. uh, wrote a couple of pseudonymous works in which he argued that it was Paul rather than Jesus who had created and founded Christianity. And so it, it's quite the, the interesting little historical trip to go, go back and to see that this has been something people have been trying to see. Paul at odds with Jesus, at least a sanitized Jesus. And that's why I think it's wonderful that C.S. Lewis comes along, and he had no doubt been told all of this stuff and swallowed some of it in his atheist phase. And then he says, you know, once you actually begin to read the Gospels, all the really harsh things are in the Gospels. And so this idea that it was, you know, Paul was just somehow the guy who made it all unpalatable. No, I mean, you got to come to terms with Jesus and uh, with the things that he said, which are not exactly meek and mild all the time. You know, John, you were talking about Christology in uh, in the Synoptics, and I know you've also you've interviewed uh, Jonathan, our friend Jonathan McClatchy, as well, and that's a and Christology in the Old Testament as well. Jonathan pointed me, and, and I'm going to say right here, I don't even always agree with all of his, uh, you know, Christological interpretations. So, you know, we we have a great relationship with Jonathan where we can agree about this and disagree about 
about that and go back and forth and it's just no hard feelings. It's, it's a great scholarly relationship. Um, he, but he brought up one that, that I really like in the book of Matthew and it's related to the cleansing of the temple where uh, the children are singing Hosanna to the son of David and the, uh, the leaders, the Jewish leaders come to Jesus and say, do you hear what they're singing? You know, they want him to stop them because uh, it's raising, you know, messianic expectations. Rome is going to be angry at us. You know, this is all behind all of this, even though they don't elaborate. And so Jesus says, have you never read, which is always this wonderfully insulting thing to say to the teachers of the law, have you never read, um, that out of, out of the mouth of babes have you perfected praise, which is a quotation of uh, Psalm 8. Well, whom are they praising? Jesus whom uh, it, it are the children praising supposedly in Psalm 8? Yahweh, God. So Jesus essentially says to the Malsia and raise you five, as the saying goes, you know, you want me to stop them from heaping messianic praise upon me? Well, they, they should praise me because I'm God, you know, basically. So um, there are these few things in the synoptics that are are very high. I don't agree with all of the ones that get brought forward, like his, his walking on the waves is sometimes connected to passages that are obviously anthropomorphic that say that Yahweh walks upon the waters. That one seems to me weak. So there's, there's various ones that I don't buy. And I think sometimes, and I am not attributing this to, to Jonathan, by the way, but, but with some other uh, evangelical scholars, sometimes there's a desire to exaggerate the Christology taught in the synoptics in order to say that we do not require the Gospel of John to make John unnecessary or gravy on top or something because then they don't want to have to defend John. I would actually say we kind of we kind of do need John because the teaching that Jesus is God it's 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 uh, big, it's new, it's different. So we need all, all of the words of Jesus we can get, and especially those more you know those more explicit ones but there are some cool ones in the synoptics as well uh psalm 8 one yeah one of the questions i was meaning to ask both of you and, and you know I, i'm still sifting through all the data myself it's the honorific title of son of god ad yeah, i know the, the claim is often advanced by anti right william lane craig that this title is strictly speaking referring to messianic kingship generally. But when I look at the way it's being employed time and time again, along with Son of Man, it, uh, it does seem to be the use of hypostasis quite clearly. And what was unique to me is when I was rereading Hebrews, you know, and, and you know, I'm not gonna go through all the, the, the authorship questions of Hebrews. I'm on the, the probably the last uh, rump of people who still hold the Pauline authorship. Uh, there's that wonderful passage about Melchizedek where uh, it describes him in being similitude without beginning of days, without end of days, without father and mother, like the son of God. And that reference there, I, I cannot see how they could strictly be anything other than supernatural. Now, I know we could easily try to find caveats and way around it, but perhaps are we being too stringent in uh, methodology about the use of these terms? Is it possible that in some cases, particularly uh, in light of second temple Judaism, as you said, you know, the Pharisees had a problem with um, Christ's divine claims, but were potentially open at times to, to claims to messianic kingship. Is it possible that other uh, communities in the first century AD had alternative and divergent forms of messianism? So that essentially it's not an even brush across the board. Instead, it's in light of what the the early church is being handed on faithfully, hence the, the need for the creedal statements that are recorded in Paul as well. Um, the, the phrase son of God, I think could sometimes just mean Messiah without necessarily being God. But we do find an interesting thing in the gospel of John um, when he, uh, he calls himself the son of God. And it's, it's, in, the con it's in connection with, you know, were they, are trying to stone him but he says you know why do you seek to stone me because i said i am the son of god okay and and they'll say you know you being a man have made yourself equal with god um and there are there are even places in uh like where the leaders are angry at him and at the moment i didn't write down the references but they'll he'll say you know 
you shall see the the son of man seated, you know, at the right hand of power and so forth. And uh, this is in the synoptics, you know, they rend their clothes, even though right there he called himself the son of man. He didn't say, you know, he didn't say before Abraham was, I am right there. Luke so, 22. You're yeah. So of. there have to be, there has to be something about the way that Jesus said these things. You know, sometimes I think we need to kind of picture it. You know, what what expression did he have in his face when he said, son of son of God, or you will see, you know, the son of man coming, that there, there had to be something about the way that he said them, the way that he used them, what they connected them to, that it were adding um, sort of resonances of deity, especially since they probably knew that he had said, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And they were investing these phrases with additional meaning that they did not necessarily have to carry and that in someone else's mouth, perhaps they would not have carried. Yeah, if you, if you look at Mark 14, you know, the, the famous statement, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power coming in the clouds of glory. Um, I mean, once again, had that statement not been in conjunction with someone who is raising the dead, you know, cleansing the blind, driving out the temple, uh, seemingly creating ex nihilo, then, you know, you could allegorize the passage, but within the weight of everything else that has been just recorded, you were sort of pushed into a bar where you must say Lord liar or lunatic. You can't escape, in my mind, it's very, I think there was a beautiful uh, video where a fellow Roman Catholic, uh, Brent Petrie uh, from Notre Dame is actually cornering Bart Ehrman at the end of the lecture and uh, just asks him like, you know, how, how can you escape a divine explanation of this? And I think even Ehrman has to uh, back down the uh, lovely and very scholarly. Uh, oh yeah, Bart Ehrman did say, okay, I've decided now that in Mark, Tim may remember the details of this better, that uh, Mark did think that Jesus was God. And he said, I changed my mind on that. How did, how did that go? He had been of the opinion that uh, Mark's use of the phrase son of man in, in Jesus' mouth was a reference to some non, uh, non-deity being from the Old Testament. And I think he may have given that up altogether now. He's, he's, he was kind of called out on that a number of times until I think he got sick of getting beat up on that one. But also that I think he's come to say that each of the gospel authors thought Jesus was God, but meant something slightly different. I think yeah, or something like that. You this know, is, this is one of the funny things about uh, modern criticism is that it, it seems to be able to see a lot of things that aren't there, in, including microscopic shades of differences and shadings that, and, and I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the different authors of the gospels, the different evangelists don't have different emphases. That is, clearly they do. Matthew is writing for a Jewish audience, Luke is not, right? We, we can see these kinds of things, but those are broad strokes kinds of things. And when you get down to super fine shaded, oh, deity, but kind of not quite the same way as, uh, that I, I think we're seeing things that aren't there. And that is a real problem. That's, that, and that is, I would say, a serious problem that besets contemporary New Testament studies. We're just too fond of seeing things that aren't there. We've already seen this in other disciplines. Shakespeare studies has gone through its own internal convulsions where all of the really sensible things that are true and enlightening that there are to be said about Shakespeare have been said before. But we feel this need to keep talking and not simply repeating what's been said. So we start going for the implausible things. And I think that that's a a disease that has caught New Testament scholarship in particular, and that there's just a great uh, desire to, like an Athenian desire in the bad sense, to hear some new thing. It doesn't have to be true. It just has to be new. And, and, and that leads me then to, you know, wonder in any other discipline for me, at least before the rise of this new methodology, it would then be perfectly acceptable to take parts of Eusebius, uh, which are within, you know, a living historical record and and treat them as potentially true. I'm not saying uncritically, but, you know, to take, you know, the the martyrdom of Peter account and assume that it's in in basis relatively true. You have apostolic succession lists in the the second, third century that clearly are being preserved to a degree. Um, That that makes the the life and times of our Lord actually incredibly detailed. 
Sure. Because that means, you, we, you know, we have more than merely Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Of course, be, beyond, of course, you know, the, the inspired words of scripture. I'm, I'm not in any way trying to put them on, on equal par with patristic evidence. But just from a strictly historical angle, um, to claim that with, th within 400 years, uh, that data is entirely just scrubbed, uh, I, I think is, is somewhat... Yeah, as you um, say, right, not uncritically, the, the letter of Jesus to King Abgar, yeah, Odessa, yeah, yeah. yeah no, probably yeah. not. Um, but a lot of those things, there is good reason to believe that Eusebius would have received on the authority of earlier sources, some of whom he names for us as he's going through it. I don't see a reason to be more doubtful about Eusebius than I am about, oh, I don't know, uh, Thucydides in his reports of things that lay within living memory that he was reporting. Um, he, you've got, Eusebius has got sources. He goes back to those sources. He's pretty meticulous in citing those sources. He's gone over this ground a couple of times. He's got the Chronicon as well. Yes. Um, sometimes he may be changing his mind a little bit about something. Sometimes he may want to say that a book like, say, the Apocalypse uh, of St. John is written by a different person than the person who wrote the gospel. I think that's a that's just a misstep on his part, but he's got reasons, reasons for wanting to do it. So not uncritically, and yet I think there's such a body of useful and prima facie credible historical information that we have in many of the church fathers that to ignore it whole hog is, it would be to commit scholarly malpractice in any other philological field. And I, I have this bad sense as I read a good deal of New Testament scholarship today that we've moved so far, swung the pendulum so far out away from the idea of a tradition which carries useful information that now the, the, the Jesus game gets played by saying, well, if it ends up looking anything like that tradition, then you lose, right? That's, you have to come up with a Jesus who's somehow as different as we can possibly make it from the Jesus of tradition, the Jesus that you would see in Eusebius, the Jesus that you would see in the Gospels. And that seems to me to be a real uh, swing way far out. And I, I have to hope that the scholarly center of gravity will come back to something a little better balanced in the future. But right now, this is where we are. So we have to wait for that to happen. One of the uh, things, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. One of the things I, <clears throat> uh, enjoyed doing recently was going over some of the patristic evidence for um, harmonization. And, uh, you know, it's well known that Origen said that we should not try to harmonize John with the synoptics. But what was what is interesting to me is what an outlier Origen is. So, um, and, and from people before Origen, it's not just St. Augustine, uh, rather oddly, in one of Dr. Michael Lacona's recent videos responding to my work, he emphasized several times, well, Augustine lived later than Origen. Augustine lived, you know, over 100 years later than Origen. He kept emphasizing that. Uh, and, and he used the phrase, Augustine's obsession with harmonization. That was the phrase he used. So the unspoken implication was that somehow Augustine's, quote, obsession with harmonization was a late development and was something that, uh, you know, like, like Origen was more authentic because he was earlier. And that's just absolutely not true. And I wrote a, a, a blog post following up on that. Um, you have you have Julius Africanus, who's earlier than Origen. You have Papias talking about the truth and uh, the, the words proceeding from Jesus himself and the truth himself. Um, you have all these other things you have. Um, well, even for that matter, Eusebius is earlier than Augustine. So, you know, now we're really, you know, we're whittling it down. Is this obsession? Because Eusebius harmonizes as well, you may recall, the early parts of um of Jesus' ministry. So is this so-called obsession with uh, harmonization something that arose somehow between Origen and, and Eusebius? You know, it's, it's not true. It was a cherry-picked factoid that in fact Origen lived earlier than Augustine. So what? Augustine is in fact more representative of the patristic mind 
than is origin as concerns harmonization specifically and their concern for literal historical truth. So uh, I, I, I had a lot of fun looking up that information and documenting that. Yeah, uh, yeah. One final note before we close as well. Um, let's shift any any concluding points. Is uh, the, the thing for me that I find remarkable about that fragment from Papias, which of course has been you know buried under commentary after commentary after commentary, and you know it's an you know an authentic interest of Eusebius is just how well, as we discussed, you know, how Joanine has, it sounds to proceed from the truth almost personifying the truth and light of Christ. And when I think of terminology like that, how consistently Johannine and synoptic terms are just blended and used authentically in the early church, it just strikes me as somewhat disingenuous to claim that harmonization is a late obsession. That Then we have to assume that, of course, then uh, all, all of historical Christianity of basically the second and third century is punk. So just to hear, uh, that, that defense which you're making, Lydia, and, and your defense, Tim, is an extraordinary blessing to the field. And just know that I will, I will be carrying these blessings with me in my heart and in my soul um, as I try to, to enter this lion's den, as it were. Uh, and just, just to know that you are there as resources and your research and your writing, I think is going to influence a whole new generation of scholarship because if we see this critical approach as being adopted by, you know, f fellow, you know, fellow believers, the likely Kona Evans, and, and at times even uh, Craig and um, Wright, and more skeptical scholars like Crossan and Ehrman, it, it seems to me it's very difficult then to go and proclaim the good news to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So. I think just as Athanasius, you know, of old, uh, held, held firm against a lot of, um, a lot of scorpions uh, in, in high places, I know that both of you are continually lanterns for me and for my work in more ways than one, and just authentically, you give me great courage. It's, that makes it worthwhile to us. That's why we do it. Absolutely. This is why we do what we do. Thank you, John. Thanks so much Absolutely. for having us. It's, it's, it's a great honor, guys, and thank you, as always, from the ball of my soul.